Hello, this is Mark Dunning, President of AWRA. Welcome to this month's posting of Windows on Water Management, short audio interviews with leaders in water resources management that provide a window into their perspectives and practice. Today, we're honored to have with us Dr. Gerald Galloway, PE, Professor of Engineering at the University of Maryland's Glen L. Martin Institute, an affiliate professor of public policy at the University of Maryland. Jerry, as most of you no doubt know, is one of our nation's leading experts in water resources policy issues. Jerry's impressive bio can be found in this posting. The focus of today's interview is a subject that Jerry has devoted much of his professional career to, managing the risks to people and property associated with flooding. For over 200 years, the nation has struggled with the challenges of increasing flood damages and determining appropriate ways to mitigate threats to human health and safety and to reduce damage to communities caused by floods. In a few minutes, avail in a few minutes available to us for this interview, I've asked Gary to provide his perspective on current approaches to managing flood risk, particularly focusing on the concept of tolerable risk. Well, thanks so much for being with us today, Jerry. My pleasure. Great. Well, just to launch into this interview then, first of all, um, how has our na national approach to floods changed over time? Uh, it's very interesting, Mark. If you can imagine yourself being a Native American living along the banks of one of our big rivers, you knew that annually the river rose. In some years it rose more than in other years. And so you adapted your lifestyle to that. You moved out of the way. In some cases you built mounds on which you could live for a certain period of time if you were out hunting. Uh, and you developed your agriculture that was uh, in consonance with the, the rhythm of the river. They lived with the river. Early settlers found the same thing. You lived on the high ground and you may have farmed the, the low ground. But as we began to be more dense in our population of, of our landscape, we needed to have some method of trying to prevent the more frequent floods that came every year from damaging what we already put into the land. And so people began to build uh, earthen barriers, levees. Uh, they did it in New Jersey to protect against the Delaware River. They did it uh, in New Orleans to, to help that city be a year-round city. And... Uh, that became the standard. And over time, from the 1700s up through really the early part of the last century, that was the, the approach that most people took. If we can keep the water off of us, uh, we will uh, live in a, in a world that's a little bit better protected. Now, unfortunately, it didn't always work. And when the levees failed, then people were badly inundated, and some of the problems were catastrophic. And that, and that culminated in 1927, when we had the big Mississippi River flood of that year. That really focused the nation on, on flood control. And then from then through, really, the 60s, uh, the purpose was let's do things that make solid engineering uh, projects. We're going to have levees that will hold, we'll build dams to hold the water, we'll do structural things to reduce the potential for flooding. Uh, by the 60s, though, we still saw flood losses were continuing. And so uh, we started to move into something called flood damage reduction, where a logical thing, we uh, recommended that people not live in high hazard areas, or if they did, they could elevate their homes or take other action to reduce the impact should a flood occur. And that continued on, yet the flood losses continued to rise. Well, in the late 80s and early 90s, around the world, uh, we experienced another of flood after flood, a catastrophic flood, and people began to recognize that there is no such thing as absolute protection from a flood. Nature has a way of giving you more than you ever thought of. And in this particular case, with the big floods in the U.S. in 93, in 97 in Europe, uh, in other places in Asia, we were having these very large floods. It became obvious that what we had to do was start looking at what was the risk we had from flooding, and instead of saying we're going to stop all flood risk, we're going to try and reduce that risk to a minimum, recognizing there's some sort of a residual risk. And since Katrina, since Katrina, the formal position of the Corps of Engineers and the Federal Emergency Management Agency has been one of 
let's deal with flood risk management instead of flood control. Recognize we can't control the floods. Uh, we can reduce the damages, but let's buy down the risk. Let's reduce the risk in an orderly fashion using all the tools available to us so that we're putting together a program that will deal with this challenge. And it will be different than we've done in the past. So flood risk management is now our current dominant approach to coping with floods. Well, how is flood risk uh, expressed? And how is this information about risk used in developing uh, our particular coping strategies for dealing with floods? Well, it, it, the flood risk management uh, puts together three things. It, you, you take the hazard that you have, the, the natural hazard that exists, and it could be certainly floods and it could be tornadoes or anything else. Uh, you take the, the hazard and you assess that. What is it? And then you look at your vulnerabilities and exposure. I'll call that one item, the vulnerabilities and exposure that exist. Are you in the way? Are you in a place that can flood? If you're on the top of the hill, obviously you don't have an exposure. The vulnerability is, is your building built of a, a material that will wash away? Are you uh, putting yourselves at risk to be in a, a high-risk zone in terms of uh, the velocities of the floods or, or the surges that may come up on the beach? And then lastly are the consequences, because risk is the, the combination of the probability of the hazard, and probability is an important part of this, the probabilities that uh, your vulnerabilities will will get to you and, and the probability of certain types of consequences. Uh, when, when you look at Katrina, at the time of Katrina, almost everybody assumed that if we had levees around New Orleans, they would work in many other places in the country. The assumption was, you build it, you'll, it will work. Well, we've learned long since then uh, that that isn't always the case. And so vulnerability has a probability uh, associated with it. Uh, no such thing again is absolute protection. Is the levee going to work? When the water gets up near the top or part way up, is it going to fail as it did in New Orleans? Um, what would be the vulnerability or flood warning system to tell people to get out of the way? What if the, the generator didn't work? So the flood risk says take into account the probabilities that things can go wrong, factor them, and see what effects different combinations of approaches to mitigate flooding will have on the consequences. And so when you take all these together, the, the consequences are what happens when it does flood, you take all these together, they represent a value. It may be something you have to express in, in numerical terms, or it may be something you can express in terms of uh, losses of life, or it may be something that you just say very high or very low. But it's a new approach that says probability is part of it and that you have to consider all the factors that can influence what's going to happen. Okay. Yes, I think I understand that. Um, so... When we do that and we get an, uh, an assessment of the risks involved in terms of uh, probabilities and consequences, how much risk is too much? Uh, that's the $64,000 question. Uh, how much risk are we willing to accept? Uh, We've got to, we start off with this concept that there is no such thing as absolute protection, so there's some residual risk, and you've got to have that. I listened to a lecture by the science, chief scientist of the Federal Aviation Administration, and she expressed, expressed to the, the group that uh, the FAA could eliminate the risk of flying by grounding all the aircraft. Well, that's not, that's not practical, but it's true. And so what do you do? On the other end of the, the, the spectrum of acceptability, is every time you get in on an airplane, there's a, a very high probability one of the engines is going to fall off. Now, you're not going to get on the airplane with that. So if you say that there's totally unacceptable risk at one end that everybody can recognize and negligible risk at the other end that everybody accepts, uh, the challenge is where are you on this spectrum? Uh, at the bottom are things that we call acceptable risks, and we drive to work every day. And that's an acceptable risk because we're comfortable with what we have. Um, on the other end, uh, you don't want to do some things. You don't want to do normally walk a tightrope across the Grand Canyon. And then in the middle are those things that are tolerable or acceptable. But where are those lines drawn in terms of flooding? There is no real answer uh, to that. 
uh, it, it's interesting. Uh, people have had standards before. People talk about a 100-year flood standard. We don't have a 100-year flood standard. The 100-year the flood that people talk about is a, a level that the National Flood Insurance Program sets for its flood insurance program. And it's got nothing to do with uh, life safety or preventing property damages. It was a figure that was derived by a group of people at the University of Chicago in the late 60s that expressed what would seem reasonable for an insurance program. Uh, for many years, uh, well, still today in most places in the country, we uh, have uh, protection for our dams that we say you must protect against the probable maximum flood, which is a very big hydrologic event. Uh, it is a critical event uh, because we don't want to see a dam collapse. In other places, the Corps of Engineers has long had a standard called the Standard Project Flood, which is a combination of uh, likely big storms in a region, and you protect against that. Some would equate that to a 500-year or a 1,000-year flood. Uh, and so what's acceptable? Those things have grown up through trial and error, through what people had as their objective. When the Congress started off in 1936, behind their motivation for the Flood Control Act was, let's not have these catastrophic floods. Uh, in 1953, the Dutch had a very big flood, and they came up with a law that says, along the coastline, we're going to have this much protection. Turns out it's 10,000-year protection. Along our big rivers, we'll have 2,500-year protection. That's an interesting way of doing it. Uh, California, in 2007, came up with a, a program that said, we'll have 200-year protection, because that's a combination of what we can afford and what we think would give people time to get out of the way if there was going to be a serious flood that might threaten their life. And so it, there is no real single answer to how much risk is too much, and, and I think that's the challenge we all face today because it does bring up a lot of interesting issues. Right. So if I, if I get to your point, uh, this, this idea of tolerable risk is situationally dependent. It depends on a lot of different factors, and you, you've outlined uh, some of them. Is there any other uh, issues that we need to be thinking about in, in uh, developing and applying this concept of uh, tolerable risk in, in flood risk management? Well, it, it, you know, it's interesting. After you have a big flood, everybody's interested in flooding. Uh, and so the definition of what's acceptable risk for somebody that's just gone through Sandy will be far different than somebody that's in another part of the country that's A, never seen a flood, and B, doesn't expect to see a flood. Uh, they may really be liable to big floods, but they don't know it, and they just assume it's not going to happen to them. So perception is a big part of determining what's tolerable risk. Uh, why do people still smoke? Because their idea of tolerable risk is that's okay, and, and their logic is it's not going to happen to me. Another thing that would drive that is what funds are available to give you the level of, of protection or risk reduction that you want. Uh, everybody assumes, oh, well, we need to have this. I had the opportunity to testify before uh, a House committee several years ago in which uh, they asked me what I thought would be a, a reasonable level, and I gave them that. And the chairman of the committee said, well, that's wonderful, and I agree with you, but we can't afford that. And, and that's a... Uh, uh, a good idea, a good good problem. We have to be simple. It's a big problem, not a good problem. Uh, the U.K. has a very interesting approach. It, they say the government will act proportionately and consistently in dealing with risk to the public. They will base all decisions about risk on what best serves the public interest. But let's swing around to that. Who, do I, who defines that public interest? So the challenge with the, defining tolerable risk is who is making that decision? Is it the federal government, the federal interest? Is it the local interest? And then, again, part of that is whose money is on the table. Uh, the, the U.K. has a, a concept of ALAR, as low as reasonably practicable. Uh, what can you afford? And you get everybody at the table and talk about it. Uh, so what I'm saying, I guess, in the long run, is there's lots of factors, and what will make the difference is getting the people around the table who are affected by this. And affected may mean... I'm paying part of that with my taxes. It may be I'm going to be flooded if there is a flood, or it may be I'm the federal or local official responsible, but getting everyone around the table and have them discuss this and come up with some sort of a solution. It, it can't be a cookie cutter, and it's 
not going to be easy to do, but some, you, you somehow can't have the same thing everywhere. The great uh, geographer Gilbert White, who is really the father of modern-day flood risk management, uh, when it wasn't called that, Gilbert White used to say, we, we need to have flood programs, but we've got to recognize there are geographic and demographic differences around the country. And I think he's certainly right. Great. Well, I, I think that's a, a fantastic insight and answer to that, that very difficult question. And I think it probably your answer there um, prefigures the, the, uh, my next question, which is uh, thinking broadly, where, where should we as a nation be moving in managing our flood risk? Uh, to me, Mark, the biggest challenge is it's very hard to do anything if you don't know what the problem is. Now, that sounds like a Yogi Berraism. Uh, you know, if you don't know where you're going, it's awful hard to get there. Uh, what is our flood risk? Curiously, and not unexpectedly, after Katrina in 2007, the Congress directed the President to conduct a national flood vulnerability study because obviously we wanted to know who is at risk and, and what was the problem. It's amazing to me that since 2007, no funds have been provided for that study. So until we have something, now there's a big study of the Northeast U.S. after sending part of the $60 billion supplemental, is, is let's go out and find out what's the risk in the Northeast. Well, what about the places that haven't had a flood? Uh, what about the places we've not thought about? Uh, the recent studies done by the National Research Council on resilience, disaster resilience, all start off uh, in the new paradigm with if you want to be resilient, you have to start off knowing what what you're defending against, what you're dealing with, what is the risk. And that says you must identify the risk and assess its impact on your community, your region, whatever it might be. But you've got to know your risk. So if the country is going to move on this, they need to address uh, what is the risk, and then they need to collectively and collaboratively assess what is the risk we're willing to accept in a given locale in the country. Uh, and this becomes very difficult. Um, do you give the same level of protection to an urban area that you would to a rural area or vice versa? Uh, do you protect farmland at the same level as you protect the, the city itself? Uh, I don't think we'd agree. I think we'd all agree that that's probably not going to be the case. We can afford some flooding, but then what protection do we have for the people that grow our crops? Uh, people who live along the coastline who provide oil and gas and fishing. Uh, they're at greater risk. What do we do about them? We need to address all these issues, but it starts with knowing what the risk really is. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, it's interesting that Congress uh, uh, authorized the study and then did not appropriate or has not yet appropriated funds for such a study. It is amazing to me that that takes place, but that's not unusual. Uh, it, it, it's the... Uh, Let's get something done, attitude, and we'll put it in the bill and make it happen. And then when it comes time to pay for it, people are not quite as willing to stand up. And and I think in some people's minds, look, we've won the battle. We've already said we're going to study this. People are happy that there's going to be a study, not knowing that the study is never going to get done. Right, right. Well, this has been uh, extremely important and, and uh, interesting fascinating uh, conversation we've had uh, uh, thus far, uh, Jerry, on, on this really critical issue. Um, do you have any final thoughts or takeaways for, for our listeners? It's a very difficult challenge to address, and it all stems from the fact, uh, going back to my friend Gilbert White, uh, who said the half-life of the memory of a flood is very short. People are willing to do something about it the day after. Within six months, we're worried about something else. We need professionals, members of AWRA, members of the engineering profession, scientists, those that are interested in public policy, to be educating the public about the threats we face and the challenges of dealing with floods. It does not make sense for us to continue to see the flood losses increasing and the possibility for life safety uh, problems for our population. As the population grows, people are moving to coastlines and to the river areas. Everybody loves to near, be near water. 
uh, sometimes it's the cheapest place to develop. People have got to understand that risk, and, and that's what we all have to do. We have to go out and find out what the risk is and then educate those around us about what it is. And then, of course, add to this the threats posed by climate change. The IPCC, our own National Academy studies, those by the National Climate Assessment, come up with the same thing. They all say that we're going to have in the future more intense storm events in many areas in this country. We've already seen it in the Northeast and the Upper Midwest. Now, these more intense storms mean bigger floods and, and possibly more frequent floods, and therefore we better be ready for it. And, and to, to put our head in the sand, to take the, uh, the ostrich approach isn't going to work because nature is there and nature is going to come back to us on this flood issue. And I, I thank you for the opportunity to just discuss this with your listening audience. Right. Well, thank you, Jerry. Uh, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, I'm sure that everyone who listens to this uh, interview will benefit from your your vast uh, experience and insights about about this uh, critical water resources challenge. As you were talking, I was thinking about a colleague of ours who uh, whose motto is uh, just remember Mother Nature at last. And uh, I think that's something that we need to keep in mind. So once again, sure. thanks very much. So uh, in closing, I, I want to thank uh, everyone who's uh, listened to this interview for being with us on Windows on Water Management. Uh, please watch this space for more interviews with leaders in water resources management in the coming months. Until next time, this is Mark Dunning signing off.